This is an optocoupler. It's used to control circuits and we're going to learn how they work and also how to design some simple optocoupler circuits in this video. Optocouplers are integrated electronic components that look something like this. They are also known as optoisolators, optical isolators, and photocouplers. In this version, we have the main body with four pins. Pin one is the anode. Pin two is the cathode. Pin three is the collector. Pin four is the emitter. And we also have a small circular indentation in the body next to pin one. And we use this to identify the different pins. On the body, we also have some text. This is the part number. We use this to identify the type of optocoupler and also find the manufacturer's datasheet. This device is basically a solid state relay which interconnects two separate electronic circuits. Circuit one is connected across pins one and two. The second circuit is connected across pins three and four. This allows circuit one to control circuit two. We can use it to transfer a signal across, but the two circuits are electronically isolated from each other. Why is that important? Because voltage spikes and noise on one circuit will not destroy or disrupt the other circuit. So our circuits are protected. They will also only allow electrons to flow in one direction because of the semiconductor materials inside. The two circuits can therefore use different voltages and currents because of the separation. We can expand the capabilities of the device by adding another component such as a transistor to the output of circuit two. This allows us to control even higher voltages and currents and automate circuit control. There are a few variations of optocouplers, but we're going to stick to the basic phototransistor version for this video. When we look at the symbol of this optocoupler, we see there is an LED symbol on the left and on the right side, the symbol looks very similar to a transistor. That's because it's a modified version of a transistor known as a phototransistor. The terminals are named collector and emitter, just like a normal transistor, except we're missing the base pin. In a normal transistor circuit, we have the main circuit and a control circuit. The transistor is blocking the current in the main circuit, so the light is off. When we apply a small voltage to the base pin, this will turn the transistor on and it will allow current to flow in the main circuit so the main light turns on. By the way, we have covered how transistors work in detail in our previous video. Links for that in the video description down below. The transistor within the optocoupler works slightly differently. It also blocks the current in the main circuit, but it acts as a receiver. When the light emitted from the LED hits the transistor, this will turn it on and allow current to flow in the main circuit. So when circuit one is complete, the LED turns on. This shines a beam of light across, which hits the transistor. The transistor detects this and turns on, allowing current to flow in circuit two. We simply control this by turning the internal LED on and off. The phototransistor acts like an insulator, blocking the flow of current unless it's exposed to light. The LED and the transistor are both enclosed within the case, so we can't see them. But we can see how they work with these simple circuits, which we will learn how to make later on in this video. So how does the LED turn the transistor on? Inside the phototransistor, we have different layers of semiconductor materials. There are N-type and P-type, which are sandwiched together. The N-type and P-type are both made from silicon, but they have each been mixed with other materials to change their electrical properties. The N-type has been mixed with a material which gives it lots of extra as well as unneeded electrons. These are free to move around to other atoms. The P-type has been mixed with another material which has fewer electrons. So this has lots of empty space where electrons can move too. When the materials are joined together, an electrical barrier develops and prevents the electrons from flowing. However, when the LED is turned on, it will emit another particle known as a photon. 
the photons hit the p-type material and knocks the electrons across the barrier and into the n-type material. The electrons at the first barrier will now also be able to make the jump, and so a current is developed. Once the LED is turned off, the photons stop knocking the electrons across the barrier, and so the current in the secondary side stops. So we can control a secondary circuit just by using a beam of light. This works because of the semiconductor material. In normal wires, the copper is the conductor and the rubber is the insulator. Electrons can easily flow through the copper, but they can't flow through the rubber insulator. Looking at the basic model of a metal conductor, we have the nucleus at the center, which is surrounded by a number of orbital shells, which hold the electrons. Each shell holds a maximum number of electrons, and an electron needs a certain amount of energy to be accepted into each shell. Those furthest away from the nucleus have the most energy. The outermost shell is known as the valence shell. A conductor has between one and three electrons in its valence shell. The electrons are held in place by the nucleus, but there is another shell known as the conduction band. If an electron can reach this conduction band, then it can break free from the atom and move to other atoms. With a metal atom, such as copper, the valence shell and the conduction band overlap. So it's very easy for an electron to break free and move to another atom. With an insulator, the outermost shell is packed. There's very little to no room for an electron to join. The nucleus has a tight grip on the electrons and the conduction band is far away. So the electrons can't reach this to escape. Therefore, electricity cannot flow through this material. However, a semiconductor is different. It has one too many electrons in its valence shell for it to be a conductor. So it acts as an insulator. However, the conduction band is quite close. So if we provide the electrons with some external energy, such as a photon, some electrons will gain enough energy to make the jump into the conduction band and become free. Therefore, a semiconductor can act as both an insulator and a conductor. The first circuit we will look at uses a light-dependent resistor and a white LED. The LDR varies its resistance depending on how much light it is exposed to. In darkness, it has a very high resistance. In bright light, it has a very low resistance. This white LED is rated for 20 milliamps. If I connect this to the DC bench power supply, we can see it requires three volts to achieve that 20 milliamps. When I test this LDR, we see that with a dim light, it's around 40 kilo ohms of resistance. When I hide it in my hand, it's around four mega ohms. And with two hands completely covering it, it's around nine mega ohms. However, when I shine the white LED onto the LDR, it's around 66 ohms. If I wrap my fingers around them both, then it's around 70 ohms. So on the primary circuit, we need a white LED, which has a voltage drop of three volts and uses 0.02 amps. We will control this with a switch and use a nine volt battery to power the circuit. The resistor is found by nine volts subtract three volts for the LED, which gives us six volts. This will be the voltage drop of the resistor. The circuit current is 0.02 amps. So six volts divided by 0.02 amps is 300 ohms. Now this circuit will work fine on 20 milliamps, but I'm going to use a slightly higher resistor value to reduce the current of the LED. This will also slightly reduce the brightness of the LED. I'm going to use a 330 ohm and a 22 ohm resistor. These will combine to form 352 ohms of resistance. So to check that, six volts divided by 352 ohms is 0.017 amps or 17 milliamps. I place the components into the circuit and it looks like this. The current will flow through the circuit like this, shown using conventional current. When I press the switch, the LED illuminates. On the secondary side, we have a red LED with a voltage drop of two volts. 
and a current of 0.02 amps. This will turn on to indicate the circuit is working. We place the LDR opposite the white LED. This will provide a resistance of approximately 70 ohms when exposed to the light. To find the resistor for the LED, we simply need to do 9 volts subtract 2 volts, which is 7 volts. 7 volts divided by 0.02 amps is 350 ohms. 350 subtract 70 ohms for the LDR gives us 280 ohms. Instead of this, I'm going to use two 150 ohm resistors, which equals 300 ohms. So, assuming the LDR is 70 ohms, we have 370 ohms of resistance. 7 volts divided by 370 ohms is 0.019 amps. So, if I place the components on the secondary side of the circuit board, it looks like this. Notice the red LED is on. That's because the LDR is receiving the ambient light from the room. To stop this, all we need to do is take some electrical tape. Just cut off a few small pieces and wrap them around both the LDR and the LED. This will block the ambient light from the room and the LED is now off. When I press the button on the primary circuit, the white LED turns on. This shines a light onto the LDR, which turns the red LED on in the secondary side. The problem with circuit 1 was that natural light was activating the circuit, so we will use an infrared emitter and receiver instead for this circuit. On the primary side we have an infrared emitter. The one I'm using is rated for 30 milliamps, but I'm going to use a lot less current than this. When I test the LED, we see at 1.2 volts it has a current of 0.02 amps, so we will use this value. By the way, if you look at this with your eye, you won't be able to see any light because it's infrared and humans cannot see infrared. Because of this, you're going to assume that the LED is off, but it's not. If you use the camera of your phone, you can see it's actually on. You can also test this yourself using your TV remote, as it also uses an infrared LED. So, on the primary side, we have a 9 volt supply and an LED infrared emitter with a voltage drop of 1.2 volts. We place a red LED into the circuit to indicate when the circuit is activated, simply because we can't see the infrared LED. This red LED has a voltage drop of 2 volts and a current demand of 0.02 amps. So 9 volts subtract 2 volts subtract 1.2 volts is 5.8 volts. The current of the circuit will be 0.02 amps. So 5.8 volts divided by 20 milliamps is 290 ohms. Now I don't have a 290 ohm resistor, so I'm going to use a 270 and a 22 ohm resistor. This gives 292 ohms. And to check that, we do 5.8 volts divided by 292 ohms, which is 0.01986 amps. So this will be fine. We will also add a switch into the circuit to be able to control it. When I connect the components into the circuit, it will look like this. When I press the switch, the red LED turns on and the infrared LED emitter will emit a beam of light. On the secondary side, we have the receiver LED. This one is rated for up to 1.4 volts and also 30 milliamps. We will include a red LED on this side to indicate when the circuit is activated. This also has a voltage drop of 2 volts and a current of 0.02 amps. So we have 9 volts on the supply, subtract 2 volts, subtract 1.4 volts, which gives us 5.6 volts. 5.6 divided by 0.02 amps is 280 ohms. I will use a 270 ohm and a 10 ohm resistor to get the required 280 ohms. I place these components into the circuit and it looks like this. The emitter and receiver are opposite and in close proximity. When I press the switch, the primary side red LED turns on and the emitter shines a beam of infrared light at the receiver. The receiver detects this and allows current to flow in the secondary side and so the secondary side red LED also turns on.
the third circuit uses a PC817 optocoupler. The input side uses an internal LED. The LED is rated for 1.2 volts and 20 milliamps. I can connect one to the DC power supply and see at 1.2 volts, the current is 20 milliamps. So we will use this value. On the input side, we will use a switch to control the circuit and also a red LED to indicate when the circuit is activated. This again has a voltage drop of two volts and a current of 0.02 amps. So with a nine volt supply, nine volts subtract two volts, subtract 1.2 volts, gives us 5.8 volts. 5.8 volts divided by 0.02 amps is 290 ohms. I'm going to use a 270 ohm and a 22 ohm resistor to make 292 ohms. This will give us 0.01986 amps. I place the components into the circuit board and it looks like this. When I press the switch, the red LED will turn on. For the secondary side, the optocoupler is rated for a maximum of 50 milliamps. We're just going to use a red LED on the secondary side, which has a voltage drop of two volts and requires a current of 20 milliamps. The secondary side will have a nine volt supply with the positive connected to the collector and the emitter connected to the negative. We must use a resistor, otherwise the optocoupler will be destroyed. Looking at the manufacturer's data sheet, we see a chart with collector current versus collector emitter voltage. The collector current will be 20 milliamps and that's from our red LED. So reading the chart, we move across until we hit the 20 milliamp line. This shows that the collector emitter voltage is two volts. We have a nine volt supply. So nine volts subtract two volts for the LED and two volts for the transistor's collector emitter equals five volts. 5 volts divided by the collector current of 0.02 amps is 250 ohms. I don't have a 250 ohm resistor, so I will use a 100 ohm and a 150 ohm resistor. These will combine to form 250 ohms. I place the components into the circuit and they look like this. The secondary side is off, but when I press the switch, the primary side red LED turns on the LED inside the optocoupler turns on and the beam of light hits the internal phototransistor. This will allow current to flow in the secondary side and so the secondary side red LED is now on. Check out one of the videos on screen now to continue learning about electrical and electronics engineering as this is sadly the end of this video. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn and of course the engineeringmindset.com.